Eureka by John Thomas, Volume 1 Chapter 2, Section 4, Part 4 The Depths of the Satan as They Speak But all among the Thyatirans were not impressible by the arts and blandishments of Jezebel and her children. The rest were a faithful remnant who repudiated her teaching and the depths which they prescribed. We need not repeat here what has been already adduced concerning the Satan, but we may add to this that the sentence, the depths of the Satan as they speak, shows that the Satan is not a solitary individual, but representative of a plurality of speakers, whose speech is enunciative of deep things called depths. These depths were adverse to the name, faith, and morality or works, styled by the Spirit, his, and therefore they were satanic depths, and those who taught them, the Satan, and those who received them, both teachers and disciples, the synagogue of the Satan. Jezebel the prophetess, and the holders of Balaam's teaching, who styled themselves apostles, and said they were Jews, being the clergy of that synagogue, clerically termed the Church of God. But in reality, the habitation of demons the hold of every foul spirit, and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Antipas, or the faithful witnesses, were the rest among the Thyatirans who had not acknowledged the depths of the Satan as they speak. Antipas still retained his original position in all the ecclesias, which, although teeming with false brethren, both in the presbyteries and among the multitude, had not yet been spewed out of the mouth of the Spirit. Antipas was the remnant of the woman's seed, contending earnestly for the faith, once for all, delivered to the saints against all, the depths of the Satan, as they speak, which, in their logical effect upon the minds of Christians, perverted the gospel, and made it of no effect in regard to justification and practice. The star presbytery in Ephesus had fallen from its first estate. Still, it had not fallen to the lowest depths, for Antipas, was among them as those who could not bear them that are evil, but tried them who pretended they were apostles and are not, and found them liars. Antipas was also among the Smyrnians as the rich, because faithful in works, tribulation, and poverty. Also among the Sardians as the few names even in Sardis which have not defiled their garments, and in Philadelphia as the little strength of the ecclesia there, which the Spirit says had kept my word and not denied my name. But among the Laodiceans, the Antipas are not found. Their existence is a supposition as If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. The Satan was triumphant there, and the faithful witnesses reduced to such an insignificant minority as to be noticeable in the prophecy only as an hypothesis. They were a contemptible few, not submerged in the depths of the Satan as they speak. But 
not enough of them to save the ecclesia from being spewed out of the Spirit's mouth. A few did hear the Spirit's voice among the Laodiceans, and became fugitive in consequence. They were no longer found in the churches, but in their own peculiar place in the wilderness, where as the woman and the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus anointed, they were nourished for 1,260 years from the face of the serpent, being a Catholic of the Laodicean type. Revelation 12, verses 14, 17, 9, and 10. The extract from Cyprian sufficiently illustrates the depths of the Satan as they speak. In the practice of the so called Christians of the middle of the third century, he says that the long peace or time given for Jezebel to repent of her prostitution, instead of being attended with the result desired by the Spirit, produced a contrary effect. It corrupted the discipline divinely revealed to us. In this, Cyprian and the Spirit agree. For the latter says, And she repented not. Our faith, says Cyprian, was almost dormant, and his details of practice must have made them an object of contempt even to the pagans. But, though good practice will not always result from sound teaching, owing to the perverseness of the flesh, bad practice is the certain consequence of satanic teaching. The depths of the Satan spoken produced the depths of the Satan wrought. The energy, or working of the Satan, was elaborated by the teaching of the fathers of the second and third centuries. These fathers were the they of the text before us, as the depths of the Satan as they, the fathers, speak. Irenaeus, Tertullian, Pantanus, Clemens Alexandrinus, Origen, Cyprian, and so forth are a specimen of these clerical fathers whose teaching corrupted the discipline divinely revealed. Of Irenaeus, history testifies that his philosophy had its usual influence on the mind, in darkening some truths of scripture, and in mixing the doctrine of Christ with human inventions. In general, however, notwithstanding some philosophical adulterations, he certainly, says Milner, maintained all the essentials of the gospel. That is to say, what Milner regarded as the essentials. He is said to have been instructed in Christianity by Polycarp of Smyrna and Papias of Hierapolis, contemporaries of the Apostle John. Irenaeus became overseer of the Ecclesia at Lyon in France, about AD 169. One of his sentiments left on record is certainly sound. If man, says he, had not been united to the deity, he could not have been a partaker of immortality. Another also is perfectly scriptural. Speaking of Jesus, he says, He had flesh and blood, not a different kind from what men have, but he gathered into himself the very original creation of the Father, and sought that which was lost. And again, the word of God, Jesus Christ, on account of his immense love, became what we are, that he might make us what he is. He has left on record a testimony 
to the corruption of the faith already prevalent in his day, in a letter to Florinus, a person of rank in the emperor's service, whom he had known in early life. Florinus had been seduced into heresy concerning what Irenaeus says, those doctrines, they who were presbyters before us, those who had walked with the apostles, did not deliver to you. For I saw you when I was a boy in the lower Asia with Polycarp, and you were then, though a person of rank in the emperor's service, very desirous of being approved by him. I can describe the sermons which he preached to the multitude, and how he related to us his converse with John, and with the rest of those who had seen the Lord, how he mentioned their particular expressions, and what things he had heard from them of the Lord, and of his miracles, and of his doctrine. As Polycarp had received from the eyewitnesses of the word of life, he told us all things agreeable to the scriptures. These things then, through the mercy of God visiting me, I heard with seriousness. I wrote them not on paper, but on my heart. And ever since, through the grace of God, I retain a genuine remembrance of them, and I can witness before God that if that blessed apostolical presbyter had heard some of the doctrines which are now maintained, he would have cried out and stopped his ears and in his usual manner have said, O good God, to what times hast thou reserved me that I should endure these things? And he would immediately have fled from the place in which he had heard such doctrines. Polycarp suffered death, A.D. 167. At one time, he and Irenaeus lived together at Smyrna, and held the same opinions. One Evaristus wrote an account of Polycarp's martyrdom, which was adopted by the ecclesia at Smyrna, and sent to that sojourning at Philomelium, a city of Lycaonia. The sentiments therein contained may or may not be regarded as those also of Polycarp, their late teacher, and of Irenaeus, his disciple. Speaking of martyrs in general, the letter says, They despised the torments of this world, and by one hour redeemed themselves from eternal punishment. The fire of savage tormentors was cold to them, for they had steadily in view a desire to avoid that fire which is eternal and never to be quenched. Now, the dogma of redemption from eternal punishment by an hour's burning is nowhere taught in Scripture. If Polycarp and Irenaeus taught this, they certainly held a depth of the Satan. As to the fire which is eternal and never to be quenched, it depends upon the sense of the original, whether it be classed with the depths of the Satan or not. In the modern clerical sense of the words, it is a depth. But in the scriptural sense, which is not the clerical, it is not a depth of the Satan, but one of the deep things of God. I apprehend that the Smyrnians, at least the Antipas among them, certainly would have used the expression in the sense of the apocalypse which had been sent to their star angel or presbytery some sixty-nine years before. There the fire which is eternal is the fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, and in the presence of the Lamb. Styled by Jesus, to per to Ionion, and which he says, 
has been then prepared for the Diabolos and for his agents, apocalyptically styled, the beast and his image, and the receivers of the mark of his name. Matthew 25, verse 41, Revelation 14, verses 9 to 11, and 19, verse 20. This fire is Ionian because it is kindled when the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled and at the epoch termed the hour of judgment, which immediately precedes the aeon, which continues 1,000 years. This Ionian fire cannot be quenched. It is like that fire kindled in Jerusalem in the days of Jeremiah, which Yahweh Elohim said, shall burn and shall not be quenched. Jeremiah 7 verse 20 and 17 verse 27. Nevertheless, the fire went out when its work was done, and Jerusalem was rebuilt and continued for several hundred years until it was again consumed in another unquenchable fire, which has also in like manner ceased to burn for ages past. Mark 9, verses 43 and 44. This I believe to be the sense of the Smyrnians. Not an eternal fire in the sense of the Satan. A fire whose continuance is measured by the years of God. Polycarp, in his last words, prayed, for resurrection to eternal life, both of soul and body, in the incorruption of the Holy Spirit. He looked for life after resurrection of soul and resurrection of body, that they might both then become incorruptible by the Holy Spirit. But those who adopted the letter of Evaristus and styled themselves the Catholic Church of Smyrna, apocalyptically the synagogue of the Satan, declared therein that he was now crowned with immortality and the prize of unquestionable victory. This was equivalent to saying that something called Polycarp had gone direct to heaven and had obtained the prize. This was one of the depths of the Satan, so pointedly condemned by Justin as unchristianizing those who held it. Polycarp and they evidently disagreed upon this vital question, although they styled him an apostolical and prophetical teacher, the bishop of the Catholic Church of Smyrna. If Irenaeus agreed with them, that his instructor Polycarp had obtained the prize of immortality without resurrection, if this philosophical adulteration formed a part of his philosophy, the essentials he maintained would be of little worth. We suspect Irenaeus was infected with this depth of the Satan, for he speaks of the martyrs hastening to Christ, as though they would enter into his presence before the resurrection. Nay, we are now sure of it, for further on, in his account of the persecution at Lyon and Vienne, he says of Vettius Epagathus, who suffered death, he was, and is still, a genuine disciple of Christ following the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. A quotation 70 years after John's death, from Revelation 14, verse 4. Now Vettius could only follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth, after his death, upon the principle of immediate translation to heaven, which was styled the birthday of martyrdom. In another place, he speaks of eternal fire in hell for the apostate. But enough of Irenaeus. 
who suffered death A.D. 210.